On behalf of Railway Age Magazine and Simmons Boardman Publishing, we want to congratulate you on being selected our 52nd Railroader of the Year, and congratulations to you. Thanks very much, Bill. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled and honored, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, you and uh, all the staff at Railway Age for, uh, for this recognition. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, you started on the Frisco I as a carman oiler back when? Back in uh, 1963, I'm afraid. Started off there and, and got a few uh, breaks or opportunities along the way. And then from Frisco with the BN with the merger in 1980, at the time the Staggers Act. And then left and went to Illinois Central in 89. And then the nice run with Illinois Central. And then we did the transaction with Canadian National two-year respite, and I couldn't, which I couldn't sit still. And then I came back and re-entered the, the fray, if you will, in 2012 with Canadian Pacific. Well, I was gonna ask you, you know, you, you had <coughs> such a great career. Uh, you did so many terrific things and right up to the CN, and then you retired uh, and, uh, and you come back. What, what, what motivated you? I think I underestimated how much I would uh, Missed the business, and uh, I thought we had accomplished a lot of things. And uh, but uh, I got a couple of phone calls. My wife had been pretty encouraging as far as retiring and taking it easy. And I got off the phone with one of those calls, and she said, "You should go back to work." Uh, and I said, "Why? Wow, what brings that up?" And she said, "Well, I've never seen you so passionate or enthusiastic about anything for the last couple of years." So obviously, you know, you miss this. And so uh, you're in good health and so go for it. So what did you see at the, uh, when you had the opportunity to join the CP? Well, what I found was a lot of frustration for whatever reasons now. People uh, were frustrated. They were being called the worst railroad in North America. Nobody wants to be the worst. Worst in terms of what? Well, I think worst in terms of operating worst in terms of service, worst in terms of financial performance. But I think there was the thing that maybe I have the ability to do because I, I understand this business from the ground up was to see that there was a lot of talent there. If you could, if you could uncover the mud uh, and get to the people, give them an opportunity to, uh, uh, to get back to railroading again, uh, they would, uh, they could surprise you with your performance, and uh, and I was right about that. Uh, we discovered a lot more talent than people had given the organization credit for. This whole, uh, so far, this two and a half year journey has been uh, quick and fast and successful, and it's really a result of the whole team pulling together. You know, no one individual can take an organization and, and turn it around. You just have to be kind of, the, uh, kind of the key to the door and open doors of opportunity for them and let them uh, run with it. You brought some good people with you. When I did. you came on board. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that if I've had any success in the business, Bill, it's that I've tried to surround myself with smart, bright, hardworking people because... I found early on that, that, in my view at least, the key to success in the business, I don't care what business you're in, is people. So we did bring on some, uh, some talented people that I'd have been exposed to before, some that I hadn't been exposed to. And I think if you look at the makeup of the team now, uh, there's some in-house, there's some out-house, there's some former, and we put that together. And all of us collectively have worked to create a uh, uh, a certain chemistry, a certain esprit de corps between the team that, uh, that has been uh, pretty motivating to all of us. Well, Keith Creel is one of those, one of those folks. Now, Keith, you and Keith worked together for, uh, at, at, at other railways, yes. I think, uh, for a long time. Yeah, Keith joined, first joined my team in uh, about 95 at the Illinois Central. And uh, as a an assistant train master, I believe, in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, 
hardworking, energetic, probably the brightest young man in North America, in my view, and certainly the operating side of the business. And uh, I quickly uh, picked up and saw the talents and, and that he brought to this business. And uh, as we were looking at a succession, I'm not going to be around, you know, forever. <laughs> I just had a big, big birthday, so. Uh, what birthday is that, if you don't mind me asking? Big 7-0. So uh, seven zero is big. Now we're working on eight zero, uh, but I don't think we'll be doing it at Calgary, uh, hopefully. But I think that you know that's just one example of bringing in Keith and everything he has brought to this organization. Uh, and once again, that's twenty years of working together, understanding each other. It's kind of like a quarterback and a wide receiver working together. You know, you go back to pass, you don't have to wonder about where he's going to be. You know, you sense it. He can do the same thing with me. And that's pretty powerful when you can develop those type of combinations with individuals. One of the areas that CP has been known for is uh, excellence in the, on the engineering side uh, and, and on, on the R&D side. Uh, you know, you've done some, uh, some innovative things like uh, distributed power, uh, running very long trains, uh, we're, uh, railroad working with the uh, National Research Council of Canada, um, the, those sorts of things. I think. What, besides those, what else do you th do you think sets CP makes it distinct, makes it unique? Well, Bill is, is such a historian as you are of the rail industry. Uh, you know some of the physical conditions. Yes. Uh, of the plant in mm -hmm. the Rockies and the spiral tunnels, the spiral tunnels, and, yeah. and some of the engineering marvels. Mm -hmm that people created to get uh, across the Rockies and get to the West Coast and open up those opportunities. Uh, and I was amazed as a, being a, quote, flatlander from originally Memphis, Tennessee, to see what could be done. Uh, I had been a proponent early in my career of running larger trains successfully, but I don't think I ever thought we'd see trains running the size that we're running in a safe manner with distributed power uh, exceeding 20,000 tons. And when I went into business, if the train was 4,000 tons, it was a big one. So you can see the economy of scale and what that brings to us. At the same time, it creates some challenges with track train dynamics and, and a lot of areas that uh, I would have to say that CP was certainly uh, ahead of the curve in the industry and it was ahead of my curve. Aside from uh, moving crude oil, which of course uh, <coughs> has been a big, big a hu huge boom, uh, your, your other, one of your other main commodities is, uh, is grain and that's heavily regulated here in Canada and there's, it's the relationship with, with the government has been, has been difficult. Uh, things improved, I guess, in terms of... Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, there's basically two of us of big players in Canada, CN and CP. Um, I might be a little biased, but I've said to the regulators and, and uh, legislators in Ottawa that you've got the finest rail system in the world here in Canada. You got the two top railroads. <clears throat> Don't mess too much with the winning combination. Uh, we had, because of a lot of reasons, last year. Bad with, weather being one of them. Well, weather. 75 year, worse than 75 years, coming off floods. And at the same time, a crop year, a record crop year that was something like 30% higher plus than any crop year before. So there were some real challenges. Now, uh, I think as, uh, as the dust has settled, I think both, both carriers have gained a little more maybe respect uh, from from Ottawa. I think we've had some good exchanges with, uh, with the regulators and uh, I feel very comfortable going forward that that situation will not stand in our way. It'll just open more doors of opportunity. The regulatory situation in Canada is a bit different than, than in the U.S. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there is some form of open access here to a lim very limited extent, and, and you don't seem to have a problem with that as some of our, our uh, 
you know, the, the U.S. railroads are, they're fighting that tooth and nail. Right. And, yeah. uh, it, well, what's the difference? You know, how, well, how does it work? I, number one, Bill, it's, you know, it's called inner switching, yeah. which is, relates to some degree to the U.S.'s old reciprocal switching, pre-staggers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's one of these regs that are in place, but people don't really take advantage of it because there's no need to if the individual carriers do their job. It's kind of something that could be called a you know, lever that you've got over here if needed to be used. Uh, <clears throat> I think that my view is for years, a lot of railroaders have been scared of the term open access. Yeah. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I, I think that says to me all we're gonna do would do would be open up more competition. And with a very limited number of players in North America now, that's important to keep that competitive balance. And if individual carriers, we included, provide the right type of service for the customer at an appropriate fair price, uh, we have nothing to worry about. If we abuse those, do not provide the service, we should not be resistant to someone coming in and providing that service for them. So I think it's, it's different, it's change, and people, generally speaking, their normal reaction is to you know, resist those initial change efforts. But I think that if, you, if we would look back here in 20 years, most of these things are gonna be behind us and we're gonna be settled down with those type issues. I wanted to talk to you about transcontinental mergers. Now you did approach the CSX and it wasn't the right time for a merger, but uh, you, you seem to be pretty uh, determined or that it's the right thing to do at, at, at some point. Uh, what, why do you feel that way? Well, let me, let me kind of separate myself from my CEO job at CP. Okay. I originally did some work on this while I was retired doing some consulting. And I just effect, made the observation that there's, there needs to be and there will be in the future transcontinental mergers in the U.S. Now, I'm in Canada now, effectively, so. But if you look at it, Bill, particularly eastern U.S., you, there's no more room for infrastructure. There's people sure. begging for more commuter rail, people begging for more passenger rail, people begging for more freight on different routes because of sensitivity to crude or hazmat or whatever the case might be. It's, we've got the situation in Chicago. So how are you gonna deal with those capacity issues to be able to deal with growth, to deal with the commuter situations, to deal with communities that wanna reroute if you don't sit back and take a look at the industry first and how it could be modeled, and then be sure that nobody is, is, uh, is disadvantaged competitively through that, then you could create a lot of capacity uh, just with mergers and some transparency there. Yeah. You know, we try to do uh, the interchange effectively is at the Mississippi River, as you know, yeah. up and down the river. Yeah, right. And now it's moved that a high percentage of it is in Chicago you know, the most populated city we have from a rail standpoint, with the most interchange trying to cram everything through Chicago, and it just doesn't make sense. So there's some efforts underway now from an industry standpoint that I feel very, very encouraged about that are taking place. Yeah, the, the CREATE program being one of them. Yeah, but it's, it's beyond it's CREATE. Beyond I, you know, I think that I'm not a real structured guy and that when you get a lot of committees and ad hoc committees and committees on top of that, and then you get some lobbyists involved. All you've done is created a, you know, a program that's not gonna be successful. So I think there's some efforts led by some people behind the scenes, which will grow recognized one day, that are bringing together some uh, retired individuals who don't have their old logo attached to them anymore who are coming in as, as industry observers saying, okay, if you were given the situation of what would you do in Chicago? And all you have to worry about is conceptualize, okay?
okay? Uh, there's some pretty exciting work going on. Now, I'm, try I'm trying to make some efforts to keep the other folks away from them, keep okay. the politicians away and keep Create away and keep the AR away, let them do their thing, and let's see what could happen because if that would come together, it could have some very positive issues on the industry. But the only reason for the mergers was to say if you took, you know, you effectively have two duopolies, one in the east and one in the west. And, you know, the competition between them is effectively non-existent across. But if you said one of the carriers in the east married one in the west, mm -hmm. I promise you they wouldn't route their traffic through Chicago. Okay. And I promise you when their train mm -hmm. left L.A. and was headed for Florida coast, mm -hmm. there would be a plan that's different in the day. The service would be better. The cost would be lower. It'd take le less infrastructure. And if that's not good, then I don't know what I'm doing. If and when a uh, transcontinental merger happens, because I think if, if one goes through, then I think eventually everybody, everyone else will fall into place. <clears throat> you think there's going to have to be some kind of give back in terms of uh, regulatory, whether it's reciprocal switching or so? Do you think? Yeah, and that's, that was part of the misunderstanding of our initial efforts. Mm -hmm. All we were saying was it looks like that uh, there's potential that could be uh, an opportunity to number one, enhance the shareholder value. Number two, create more capacity and avoid Chicago and improve service. That seems all good to me. Uh, but if you end up with two major rails in the U.S., uh, clearly, you're going to have to have access. You're going to have to have a case where if, if carrier A is not doing the job for the, the industry, that industry B can come over. I mean, railroad B can come over and serve them, uh, both to keep competition, both from a service and a price standpoint. And we ought to do that. I mean, competition is good. Uh, you know, this, this industry grew up for the first 150 years effectively regulated. We weren't ready to deal with reg deregulation. And I would say that, shame on us, we've done very well, but uh, it's been a hard learning experience for some people. You know, to get out of still some of that traditional overhang uh, from regulation of the long haul and the Chicago division and those things that should be become a part of history and the thing of the past. So. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we did and we talked about back in the CNB and potential. Yes. We were yeah. going to open things up, Yeah, let everybody have a shot. So, yeah, you'll have to do some things that way appropriately. There, uh, there seems to be, at least in my perception on the part of uh, not only regulators, but a lot of politicians that the railroads shouldn't be allowed to make a good, healthy profit. Why do you think that, that is? They're misguided. They're making too much money. You know. well, Where does that come from? I, I, think, I think it comes from, uh, we have a little overhang, Bill, both in Canada and the U.S. What do you mean by overhang? Well, I think from the old days that they view ut railroads as a utility, that we all okay. kind of own them, mm -hmm. that you know, CN should be still a crown corp. And so as a result, this industry went for as I said earlier, the first 125 years, never did any carrier make, come close to making this return on capital mm -hmm. as far as investments. We came to the Staggers Act in 1980, were deregulated, and then through our own fault, we saw rates decline from 80 to 2000 on about a 45 degree slope, which no sector did during that time. So we went from the start of railroads till 2000 and nobody made any returns. And you know what we went through in the 60s and 70s with bankruptcies and railroads crumbling and the infrastructure. You talk about nationalization and... Absolutely. And then now we hit in 2000 and now rails have gotten their act together. They're providing a better service to the customer, are being rewarded and making some returns and... and doing well in the market, and people say, look, they're abusing things. And the people that argue the most 
that we should be regulated and we make too much money are the ones in their industry, if you raise those issues, would be squalling all the way to yeah. Washington. Oh, yes. So I, I think, it, once again, it's just it's political pressures and push and say, hey, here's why the grain rates are up is because, uh, you know, and there's a lack of understanding yes. of, of markets and how markets move. You know, you go with grain and, and you say, well, you're doing well with the grain. Much better than last year. Well, the market's soft. Nobody wants to ship any grain. But I know one thing is happening. When grain's going to move every year. People are going to eat every People year eventually. People have to eventually. eat, yes. <laughs> but here's what happens. They add, because the world market's not good, people are sitting on grain and hold it. But when the market opens up, everybody's going to want to go at once. Now, that's a huge cost in assets and human resources and those things. So as we, working with shippers, become, uh, they become and we become more sophisticated about markets, they understand more about our issues, I think you're going to see a lot of those things go away. And I think one day, Washington might be a non-event when it comes to railroads. And I will dance at the foot of the White House that day. I'd like to see you do that. Final question for you. Sure. Um, when the history of the railroad industry in the 21st century uh, is written, um, how would you like to see yourself uh, portrayed? I just think if they said uh, they made a difference, mm -hmm. that this, the teams that I've been associated with, uh, that it put together this so-called schedule, precision, railroading, call it what you'd like, has had an influence on the industry. I'm not telling you it's the answer to all issues or problems. I think it addressed some weaknesses we had in the past. I think it made us stronger. Uh, I think it's influenced other organizations. And I think if we could look back and say, you know, we had some influence there in, in showing people that those co concepts would work and we could create value that uh, it'd be very nice to know. Well, Hunter, thank you very much. Uh, again, congratulations on being uh, Railroader of the Year. Uh, we'll, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you in Chicago in a few months. Thanks very much, Bill. It's been my pleasure to be with you.